care for him the way you did for me, old friend. It's the only way I know. There, there. I am ready. Lady Signa, you are guilty of treason against the Guild. You have breached the sanctity of the loom and compromised the fulfillment of the pattern to indulge your own selfish desires in direct defiance of the elders. You are henceforth and forever outcast from the Guild of Weavers. You shall neither behold this child nor set foot upon this island again. From now until the end of your days, you shall wander the skies in perpetual solitude. Your mournful cry shall be a lesson to all who would defy their destiny. village saw the great swan disappear across the sea that night. But it did not take long for them to hear of Lady Signa's defiance in the sanctuary and the elders' terrible vengeance. All were curious to behold the new infant, a child born not of woman, but out of the loom itself, and whose creation was unforeseen. It was decreed that the child be raised outside the ways of the guild until his coming of age, 17 years hence, when his future would be decided by a high council. The old serving woman, Hetchel, agreed to raise the loom child as her own. She named the little boy Bobbin. Bobbin? Bobbin, wake up, child. Uh, Hatchel? That's right, dear. Out of bed. Uh, uh, still dark. I know, little one. Get up quickly and get dressed. Why? Sleepy? There's something outside I want you to see. Quickly now, before the sun rises. I told you to bring your quilt, didn't I? Here. My shawl is warm. I don't see anything. Patience. She will come. She's come every year ever since you were born. What does she look like? She looks... Wait. There. B between the trees. No. No. Only an owl. The village looks small from up here. Which star is that? The bright one? That is the morning star. You can even see it in the daytime if the sun is right. Look, down there, flying low across the water. Do you see? It's just a seagull. Look again. Oh, a swan, Bobbin. A white swan. Happy birthday, poor boy. Here she comes. Look, 
She's flying over. She's beautiful. Yes. Still beautiful. Why does she sound so sad? Because she is alone. Proud and alone. She's flying away. Where is she going, Hitchell? Out beyond the pattern, I expect. Can we go visit? Stand away from the edge. No, little Bobbin. Those who are born of the pattern are hemmed into its web forever. Where that swan goes, we cannot follow. The sun is in my eyes. You're yawning. <laughs> Come. Back to home and bed for you. The years were kind to Bob and Threadbare. The boy grew tall and slender, with wide blue eyes that sparkled with mischief and intelligence. Yet Bobbin never went to school. The elders of the guild would not permit it. The other children were told he was a halfwit, and they taunted him with terrible cruelty, throwing stones if he came too near. And so the friendless boy spent his days in solitude, combing the beaches for sticks of firewood and exploring the hills and forests of the weaver's little island until no one knew them better than he. Old Hetchel cared for Bobbin like her own son. She saw his growing bitterness and begged the elders to end his cruel exile. But the elders were afraid of Bobbin, and not without reason. His unexpected birth had thrown the pattern into chaos. Year after year they watched with growing apprehension as shadows of apocalypse spread across the web in the loom. Bobbin's thread was weaving its way towards a destiny of overwhelming consequence. The pattern was disintegrating. No one knew how to stop it. The elders never told Bobbin who he was or how he came to be. They prayed that Bobbin would be unable to fulfill his destiny so long as he never left the island and never learned the ways of spell weaving. They did not suspect that Bobbin's education had already begun. Not tonight, Mother Hetchel. Especially tonight. Draw the curtains, boy. Sit here by the fire. Now, tell me, how many threads are there in a draught? Four. Their names? The throw. That's one. The beat. Two. The treadle and the rest. Good. Let's see if you remember the draught I taught you. Spin it for me. Uh, 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 Pity. Listen to me. Now you know what the other boys do in school all day. I guess I'll never learn to weave. Rubbish. Do you suppose every weaver starts out with a golden throat? It takes years of practice, years. How long do you suppose the elders have been weaving? Nearly as long as I have, and that is a very long time indeed. But where do I begin? You begin with this. Do you know what it is? No. This is called a distaff. Our ancestors used a distaff to spin flax into thread. We use it to spin music and light into threads of influence. Show me. Hold the distaff in your hands. Like this. Don't be afraid. Now, spin that draft I taught you again. Just the first thread. Mm. Flat. 
spin it again, dear. This time, slide the thread high in your throat, like this. Can you do that? I think so. It's glowing. It's telling you when your pitch is correct. Try the beat and treadle threads. You learn quickly. What happens if I spin all four? Let's find out, shall we? Let me shut this first. All right. Listen carefully. I want you to spin those four threads again. Wait for the distaff to glow before you go on to the next. As you spin the last thread, point the distaff at the ball of yarn inside my knitting basket. But you just closed it. Indeed. Those four threads form a pattern of opening. You're going to lift up the top of that basket without even touching it. Whenever you're ready. Does it hurt? <laughs> Tingles a bit. Remember, concentrate on the ball of yarn inside the basket. Spin. Concentrate. Now. Point. Not at the window. Wow. Shh. Blow out that light. Sit still for a minute. think anybody heard us. What other drafts do you know? Give me that. You've done enough weaving for one night. Off to bed with you. You have a big day ahead and we both have to get up very early. Let me go alone this year, Mother Hetchel. Alone? Well, I suppose you're old enough. Go alone, Bobbin. I don't mind staying in bed late this time. It was still dark when Bobbin awoke. Quietly, so as not to disturb old Hetchel, he slipped into his warm grey robe and stepped outside into the chill before dawn. The climb up the cliff path was steep and dangerous in the darkness. Only the waves crashing against the rocks below broke the stillness. Bright stars twinkled overhead. It was still half an hour before sunrise when Bobbin reached the top of the cliff. He sat down beneath a crooked old tree and leaned back to wait for the 17th visit of the great swan. In less than a minute, he was fast asleep.